Welcome to the 57th annual Commander's Call. Uh, before you leave today, we hope you will be inspired, motivated, and most importantly, educated. Our goal this morning is to empower you with everything you need to know to carry the American Legion's message to Capitol Hill with the passion, confidence, and knowledge you have with the over two million veterans, their families, and their votes, most importantly, behind you. We are the largest and most respected veteran service organization in the nation. We are the American Legion. I'd like to begin by introducing our first speaker. He's been asking us to carry the legacy forward. It's a proud legacy, indeed. And he is contributing to that legacy by fiercely advocating for veterans and their families. A retired Air Force officer and veteran of the Vietnam War, he's the first member of the great Department of Oregon to lead our organization. It is my pleasure to introduce the National Commander of the American Legion, Charles E. Smith. Thank you, Jim. Good job, brother. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Oxford, and good morning, American Legion family. Hoorah. It is such an exciting time to be in Washington. We have a new administration and a new Congress. And no matter what your political persuasion is, it is exciting for the American Legion. It is, is exciting because we are nonpartisan. And with a new leadership in Washington, we look at all new possibilities. As I like to say during my acceptance speech after you elected me as your national commander, accentuate the positive. We see a lot of positive signs coming from Washington. The new VA secretary, Dr. David Shulkin, seems committed to making the VA better than ever before. That isn't to say that there aren't some serious problems to address, but he does agree that it is a system worth saving. Let me be clear about our position regarding choice. We are not against the concept of health care choices for veterans. Realistically, not all veterans would find it convenient to use VA. Veterans in my hometown in Hines, Oregon, in Eastern Oregon, for instance, must travel more than 200 miles to find the nearest VA hospital. Although there needs to be a well-managed partnership with private providers to serve veterans in remote areas, we are against the current mess that is called choice program. Delays, non-reimbursement for services, and bureaucratic entanglements are constant experiences for many who have attempted to use this program. Additionally, no veteran should have to experience a long wait time to be seen by a VA doctor, and we are eager to work with Dr. Shulkin in fixing this problem. The American Legion shares his goal to make VA so great that veterans would overwhelmingly choose VA over the private sector. We think the VA is already moving in the right direction, but as the president would say, let's make it great again. I'm excited because in the last Congress, the House of Representatives agreed with us that the antiquated appeals process for veterans' disability claims needed to be modernized. The current process, if left alone, will result in veterans having to wait an average of 10 years by 2027 to hear a decision on their appeals. This is more than twice the time that it took for the United States to fight and win World War II. According to VA's own 2016 numbers, nearly half a million appeals claims were waiting to be finally adjudicated. More than 80,000 claims were waiting for greater than 125 days. The American Legion finds this completely unacceptable. We believe the appeals modernization legislation, H.R. 457, introduced by Representative Dina Titus, will simplify and speed up the process, as well as make it more transparent. The House did its job in the last Congress, but the Senate refused to move on it. 
I am hopeful that today you will talk to your representative and your senators and tell them that we need to pass this important legislation now. The American Legion welcomes President Trump's promise to rebuild our military. More than half of all Marine Corps aircraft were unflyable this past December. Only three of the U.S. Army's 58th Brigade combat teams are considered ready for combat. The Air Force, the branch where I made a career, had a total of about 5,500 aircraft. The average aircraft is 27 years old, older than many of the pilots that are flying them. In the early 1990s, the Air Force had 8,600 aircraft, a much larger force in a much safer world. What can I say about the Navy? I was just at Joint Base Hickam to observe the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. I talked to survivors. I put my hand in the pox marks strafed into the buildings by Japanese aircraft fire. If we learn anything from Pearl Harbor, it is that we must always be prepared. Military cuts and increased operations tempo have really had a major impact on Navy's ability to protect our seas. A strong Navy is needed now, especially in Chinese construction of artificial islands in the South China Sea and increased provocations by governments of Iran and North Korea. This is why we are asking Congress to fully fund the Department of Defense with a real and robust budget and not an unsustainable continuing resolution. Does anybody really believe that the world is safer now than it was during the Cold War? The conclusion of the bipartisan 9-11 Commission is that our enemy was at war with us, but we were not at war with them. The courts need to recognize that it is the president who has the ultimate and constitutionally mandated responsibility to keep us safe. The bottom line is that we need to take a very hard look at our immigration and entry policies. While we have been very effective at stopping terrorist attacks, look at what has been happening in France, Germany, Belgium, and Turkey. And as we have seen in Boston, San Bernardino, and Orlando, we won't be able to stop all of these horrendous attacks. But every attack that our authorities can stop is a valuable victory that saves an incalculable amount of lives. Finally, I would like to say a few words about the deniers. These are the people, some in the media, some in Congress, and some protesting on college campuses and in our streets, who deny that our flag has any spatial significance. It's just a piece of cloth, they say. It is a piece of cloth, all right. It's also the fabric of our nation. These people deny that flag desecration is a problem. It hardly ever occurs, they say. Yet a quick Google search, you will reveal thousands of images of people doing just that. Some in Congress are denying a hearing on the flag amendment. By doing so, they are denying the rest of Congress the chance to vote on it and denying the American people to right to pass this measure through their state legislature and enshrine this protection into the Constitution. That's our Constitution, the Constitution of the American people. And these deniers say Congress has more important issues to address and that the flag protection amendment is a waste of time. I say, Pass the amendment, and we won't bother you with it again. Otherwise, you will keep hearing from us. We never quit our missions in the military, and we are not going to quit now. Because that's who we are in the American Legion. We love peace, but we will always fight for what is right. Thank you all, and God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Commander, great work.